Hi, everyone. I think we'll get started. Uh, I know we have a number of people online. I think these are the panelists only, not all of the participants. So um, uh, there are others who will be watching in. I think we're also recording this session. So FYI, if you're going to speak, uh, we are doing a recording of this. I want to make you aware of that. Um, I think our intention today is to bring everybody together for the first time since the more public announcement to have a conversation. Uh, invite newcomers to the conversation who have not been previously aware of this, not because we didn't want to invite anyone, but simply because we uh, were just concentric circles reaching out to people who were introduced to us at various times by others. And so um, this is our more public uh, announcement with an intention to form an open wallet foundation later this year, ideally, and get this off the ground. Uh, what we want to do is make sure that we're not excluding anyone as we lead up to that. And in the process of doing this formation, I want to make sure that everybody has an option to uh, participate in the conversation and what we're, what we're building together. Um, there seems to be a lot of interest in, in this area and a lot of opinions. Um, and that is not uncommon in open source. Uh, we deal with that all the time. Uh, but I think our challenge over the next you know, few weeks is to coordinate what is sort of that minimum viable foundation that we can all work towards together the core of what everybody really needs out of this. There may be a lot of uh, interesting ideas that people have, opinions people have, or views of how certain things should work. And um, I, I, I just encourage everybody, let's try to focus on that area where we can find common ground right now and get a starting point going. It's open source, so contributions are more than welcome. I, I think one of the things we are also trying to identify is what contributions of engineering talent, code bases, and things are expected to be coming. There was uh, some various debates that have been going on about whether, you know, we should be funding a central development team or have a, develop, uh, a central coordination team around the development effort or some way to assist in to, into getting a core engine out there as fast as possible that's viable for people to use and build uh, their own wallets from. Uh, if you missed Daniel's uh, keynote this morning, I thought it was on point and on message about this is about building a wallet engine. This is not the Firefox wallets. So um, we're not anticipating to be a wallet service provider or managing a wallet infrastructure uh, for this. Um, but if other organizations are going to be spinning up wallets and everybody's going to be doing the exact same technical work effort and architectural discussions and everything else, why not do it together? Let's have an open conversation about it, build an open core that all of you can build your own solutions and products from or services. We have governments involved who are very interested in this. We have private companies. We have many different sectors from airlines, banking, financial services, um, uh, telcos, I mean, gaming. I'm going to be talking to our gaming community in a few weeks. So there's a number of different potential use cases for this. Then you get into practical use cases like automotive companies are already dealing with these challenges with digital car keys and things like that. And how do we uh, enable them to uh, work in an open uh, model with us on this. So with that, I, I hope to not have to say much today. I think it's more about all of you coming to a consensus together. And um, with that, uh, Daniel has uh, brought us all together in, in a way I think many of us have been connected to Daniel who are on the panel. Um, but now that we're opening this up to a broader conversation, I, I think it's it's time that we start to push this into more of a community conversation. Uh, I'll let Daniel take the lead here, but I don't think he views himself as the leader of this by any means, and uh, just a, a fire starter to uh, get the conversation going. So, with that, yeah. Thank you, Mike. Um, we camouflage this as a panel discussion, uh, but uh, what this really is, is a marketing and advertising event. We're trying to convince you to join. And um, that's really why we're here. Uh, the people on the panel uh, and I discussed, you know, what the question should be. We have, I think, 40 minutes in total, um, you know, five of which already elapsed. Uh, we are 15 people. So we're left with 15 people and 35 minutes. And we really want to focus on one primary question today, which is, why are you here? What excites you about the Open Wallet Foundation? Um, and why should other people potentially um, as excited as we are to be part of this? 
I'll try to go over maybe uh, everyone here alphabetically. I think, Alan, uh, you are the first, and I hope I will not screw up. And if other people, you know, I see some of my my heroes, Brian, you're, you're here. You're not officially part of the panel, but if anyone wants to say something, who has something to say about panels, please feel free to join in. This is very much the spirit in which we're here. This is not about, you know, a, a small group uh, having backdoor or back channel conversations. It's about bringing different people from different industries together, bringing the private sector and public sector together to hopefully create secure, interoperable, multi-purpose wallets together. So with that, Ellen, uh, I'm over here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, uh, no worries. Just I make sure everybody had a seat. Uh, my name is Alan Bachman. I'm an identity practitioner and research architect. And uh, I think, you know, this is an important movement. I'm excited to be uh, here at the announcement. I think it was the pregnancy, <laughs> as it was stated. And um, I think this will spur a lot of innovation. And uh, I'm happy that it's uh, going through the open source. Thank you. Andrew, I think you're next, and a special thank you because it is in the middle of your night. Uh, that's the kind of commitment the Open Wallet Foundation requires. So before you commit, uh, look at Andrew, look at Juliana. This is what is expected from you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Daniel. It's, uh, it's the beginning of the morning, I think, over here on the west coast of uh, North America. Hi, I'm uh, Andrew Hughes, um, Director of Identity Standards at uh, Paying Identity. Um, and um, not sure how many know, but Ping's been around for over 20 years now. And uh, open standards, open source, it's, it's in our DNA. Um, you know, from the beginning, uh, our, our early and mid and late uh, identions, as we call ourselves, um, have worked on, contributed, implemented, debated, uh, standardization for communications, uh, identity, interoperability, um, all the way through. Um, we've got a proportionally large standards team uh, for the size of the company, and we're active in the um, in the identity interconnection standard space, as uh, many of you know. Um, it's an exciting time. Um, you know, we've uh, we've watched the the digital credentials uh, world start to wake up over the last, let's call it five years. Um, early attempts uh, lead into learnings uh, which we build on. Um, and here we are. Um, at, at Ping, we've really tried to take a look at the entire environment and landscape of what needs to happen for a successful digital credentials world. Um, where people are an actual part of it, not just holders, not just agents, but actual people. Um, corporations can do what they need to do. Governments can do what they need to do. Um, and it comes down to the infrastructure at the end of the day. Um, and one of the critical pieces is the wallet, the wallet agent. Um, without that, you can't scale it, probably. Um, you would rely on each individual to do their own tiny thing, and it would be hard to connect everyone up. So uh, we're really putting our, our attention to the wallets and the Open Wallet Foundation. Um, and, you know, we're, uh, we're proud to be a part of it. Um, it continues on with the, the direction that Ping has, um, supporting the open standards and, uh, as much as possible, the open source world. Um, and let's get that uh, common toolkit um, out into place so that we can specialize on the things we specialize in and really looking forward to contributing. Thank you. Thank you. Rin, I think you're next and everyone who's not on West Coast time, uh, three minutes tops, please. Um, exception for the people who are joining from the West Coast. Uh, thanks, Daniel. I'm Bryn Robinson Morgan. Um, I work at MasterCard within our digital identity business, and we're building a globally interoperable network for digital identity. So digital wallets aren't new. In fact, the most popular ones have been around for over a decade now. So why is the mission of the Open Wallet Foundation important? 
Well, as we move towards Web3, where digital credentials will be fundamental to how we interact and engage with products, services, and each other, wallets will become a critical component of the functioning of the web, just as browsers are today. At MasterCard, we lead on digital trust through our engagements at Trust Over IP, ID2020, and many other industry bodies. And we commit to these communities because they drive innovation and interoperability. And this in turn supports our mission for convenient, smart, and secure ways to interact in the digital age. An open engine as the foundation for digital wallets has the potential to accelerate the shift to a more equitable, privacy enhancing and secure web architecture. And that's why we're here today. Thank you very much, Bryn. Uh, we are lucky to have four credit card schemes involved in the discussions. Uh, if you are hearing this and you are working at uh, the fifth that is not part of it, uh, please uh, <laughs> do, do consider do consider joining uh, this this effort. Um, if I jump over someone, um, uh, you know, please do make yourself heard. I think David, you are next alphabetically. All right, thank you. I um, I, I, knew, I anticipated needing to build on others because we I, I don't want us to be duplicative. So, Brent, I loved your comments in the previous comments. Of that, they were wonderful. If I, if I try to add a new facet to it, I think, you know, w the feedback that we get in our work with clients around the world is the, as Accenture, sorry, Dave Tree from Accenture um, is the world's largest techni you know, technology services company, kind of pure play services company. And our work with partners, um, platform providers, our clients around the world, the feedback that we're getting is we're envisioning the digital future that we're moving towards. You know, we, we we just have tremendous hope and excitement around the business model change, right? The the ability to simultaneously enable us as individuals to be able to navigate the digital world in an even better way that we nav navigate the physical world with something like this, where we can have the the portability and and lovable, effective usage of our identity, money, and objects as we move from place to place to place is just you know completely congruent with the direction of travel of I think all of the societal input, the regulatory, you know, the regulatory direction and the like. And so to be able to uh, help drive that forward and change the nature of what a winning digital business is from one that can position itself to harvest data that is, you know, has been sold and resold and, you know, and, and we've, we've all lost control over and suffer from the privacy and security dimensions of to a world where the winning digital business is the one that can earn the most trusted access to the data that we're individually controlling and on, on, you know, on our terms of how long we share what with whom and the ability to revoke it is just massively powerful. Uh, I couldn't, couldn't see it as more foundational to the digital future. Thank you, David. Drummond, I think you're next. Um, Drummond Reed, uh, Director of um, Trust Services at uh, Avast, probably best known to many of you as an antivirus company, just announced its merger with uh, Norton LifeLock. But the major new thrust of um, the combined company is digital trust services. And uh, it's actually very easy to explain why Avast is a core supporter of this new initiative. A vast mission is to enable and protect digital freedom for every person on this planet. And with the rise of decentralized identity and verifiable credentials, the locus of control of our digital lives, as you just heard from, from David and the other speakers, is um, going to become not one digital wallet, but a set of digital wallets. That's the big difference between this, that we carry one of, how many of us run our entire digital lives from one device, right? So we need digital wallets that will operate across all of our devices that will maintain those cryptographic keys, maintain those uh, credentials that we're gonna use to control that life. <clears throat> we therefore do not need just wallet interoperability. We need wallet portability, full complete portability of our digital wallets, okay? An individual needs to be able to take them anywhere, use them on any device, any operating system, any app or service that they want, 
anytime, anywhere for life, just like they can do with this, okay? That is why we need a world-class digital wallet engine um, that ensures that it, interoperability and portability is built in and you will be able to move across you know, all the devices and vendors that you need. And that no vendor, no matter how big or powerful, will be able to control your digital life by locking you into a proprietary wallet. So it's that simple. Avast supports the formation of the Open Wallet Foundation. We intend to be a very active contributor in the development and the you know, selection of standards and the advocacy because we support digital freedom and we invite every one of you to do that. Thanks. Thank you, Drummond. And, uh... You know, so far, I think we did not have a single bad open wallet day, but if we ever have one, I'll think back on our conversation in Denver. Um, to me, it was such an inspiration to, you know, see how you responded to the original idea. And, and it's great, great to have you here. Uh, Judith, I think you're next. Thank you. First, I want to thank you for bringing us all together. You're a master at bringing the, the various groups together. I want to say apologies to all the people who are behind me. It was, you know, it's the end and to these, but I'm going to face the screen for all those people that are out on the internet and my friends who I see here as common speakers. I am Judith Fleener. I am the Director of Strategic Engagement for the Trust Over IP Foundation. And the Trust Over IP Foundation is a foundation to create a robust set of standards that are interoperable and scalable for the digital layer of trust at the internet. So within our architecture, which has both all the, the technical components compared and paired with the um, governance that's required, because we know technology alone does not do it. It has to be paired with governance. Um, this Open Wallet Foundation so fits into our mission because within the technology stack, there are a million components that have to be in play for that to happen. So one of the component specs that, that needs to get developed and written is one for wallets and the engine behind that. Um, one of the things about Trust Over IP is we partner with all the other foundations, whether it be the Decentralized Identity Foundation. I've seen Dick here from uh, OIX and my friends from, uh, uh, you know, whether it be FIDO or uh, OpenID. We work together and we try to look at what is it that we at our foundation does special from another foundation and let that other foundation do what they're best at, what their mission is to do. And so from an open, uh, from a Trust over IP foundation standpoint, this is just a foundation that's going to do one of the component pieces that fits in to our full interoperable stack. And we couldn't be more delighted to work with our friends in other foundations. And I see our steering committee members on this screen and in the room. Um, so we're just excited. Thanks for pulling us together. Thank you very much, Judith. Uh... I think, Juliana, you are next. And again, a special thank you to you and uh, to Andrew for being here at such an early hour. Oh, thanks, Daniel. And thanks for uh, for having me here and um, grateful to have the opportunity. Um, so my name is Juliana Kavik and I am on the Identity Standards team at Microsoft. And I'm going to tee off of what Drummond started with, which is uh, physical wallets are trusted. They're simple, they're accessible, and they provide holders with both control and choice. And they are a physical integration point for multiple credentials. And that wallet does not care if it holds a driver's license or as a Canadian ticket to a hockey game. Ultimately, a digital wallet needs to do the same. But digital wallets are tough they're tough things to architect and build well and when you factor in interoperability evolving standards frameworks policy regulations while at the same time trying to enable trust simplicity equitable access control and choice it becomes a monumental task that only a few can take on an open wallet can help it can help a lot 
it can provide a common core that enables, pardon me, interoperable secure exchanges that align with the standards under the frameworks for policy and governance. And it can also be the integration point for digital identity and support a plurality of wallets that enable the deployment, deployment of digital services at scale. And that's a really important thing that we are missing right now. Beyond that, however, there is another really important benefit to an open wallet. By providing the tools to simplify the effort for wallet development, we can reduce the complexity and risk, as well as the cost to a broader group of service providers, and that is going to foster innovation. Thanks for having me here. Thank you very much. Lydia. Oh. Thanks, Daniel. Um, it's great to be here with a room of so many friends and new people we've yet to meet. Um, so my name is Kalia Young. I co-founded the Internet Identity Workshop in 2005, and I've been working on user-centric identity for almost 20 years. I'm here to help the initiative work for everyone and not just a small group of companies. I think we have a lot of perspectives to hear from and listen to, and we need to really support all the different groups and really a broad range of stakeholders that have come together to understand what their needs are, why they're asking for certain features and standards and things, and really find a way to build alignment early on. In the first go, not everybody's gonna get what they want. <laughs> because we got to ship a product, but I think we need to build trust, enough trust that we, we trust each other to keep collaborating together. And I also want to specifically call out the need to really engage with civil society and with organizations who are doing advocacy in the digital rights space and those even not necessarily in the digital rights space who are on the ground working with people globally. Um, so I hope that those perspectives can be invited in sooner rather than later, and that we can really build a solid foundation for open digital wallets for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Kalia. Marie, I think you're next. Great. Well, thank you for inviting and getting us together, Daniel. My name is Maria Ustunov. I'm heading up digital identity at Visa. Um, very pleased to meet you. Um, we already see that wallets have a significant impact on payments and, of course, on digital identity services as well. And I just, I'm expecting that that's going to increase in importance. The wallets, they are they're convenient, highly flexible, secure. They give a great user experience for payments. So you can say I'm a little bit single minded, but we already see the, the, the impact. Um, on services to make it much easier to buy and to, to pay for goods and services. So in my view, um, it's very good that the consumers, the payment providers, the merchant, the whole ecosystem, and I'm not talking just about wallets for payment, but of course everything else that, we've, that we have talked about, that they have a choice of wallets. This leads to innovation, to efficiencies, and of course we talked already about interoperability and about the ability to use secure wallets across um, cloud, uh, cloud platforms and operating systems. So we are very interested by this open source initiative. Um, I look at it as being in a very good position to encourage global interoperability with existing wallets and new initiatives as well, such as the EU identity wallets that's being specified by the European Commission in the IDAS uh, 2.0 as well as all the standards around like the mobile driving license, digital travel credentials and, and so forth. So we're very much looking forward to the, uh, to the future um, to contribute in whatever way we can um, and, and the outcomes. So again, thank you, Daniel, for bringing us together. It's a great initiative. Thank you, Marie. And I think you are, you are mentioning something really important, especially for the people here in Europe, which is the EU reference wallet. Um, I'm not sure if I'm saying something that is confidential, um, uh, you know, by, by saying that three of the consortia that are part of the EU reference wallet um, are um, also uh, part of the Open Wallet Foundation discussion. 
And I very much hope that, you know, whoever is going to be picked for the reference wallet, uh, we will incorporate uh, code for the EU reference. We're going to incorporate code, hopefully, for uh, a lot of other uh, jurisdictions outside of the European Union to end up with something that we take for granted today. Whether we take our driver's license or our passport <laughs> today to Tokyo or to, uh, you know, China or to Russia, wherever we, we go, my Swiss driving license, my Austrian passport is being recognized. And I think that's exactly where we need to, um, to get going. Hello, I'm Joni Nevalainen from CSC Finland. I've been following the EU. Hello, Joni Nevalainen from CSC Finland. I've been following the EU self sovereign identity wallet uh, development. Uh, and there's been a bunch of uh, back and forth between Italy and uh, Germany and, and uh, DBB, uh, they have a uh, 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 proposal stage go ongoing, uh, different suggestions on uh, what kind of use cases will, will there be. There's a suggestion about ISO standard 18, uh, 18013-5, among others, and then uh, which was completed in 2021 uh, September, and there's an extension of, of that for online business as well. Uh, there's interest in uh, open source uh, um, implementation and SDKs in that front, and um, it's uh, going onward. Onward, so I believe the first re reference implementation is scheduled for fourth quarter this this year, and it'll iterate from that. But um, as as these identities are relevant for uh, governments and business and research and what not so uh, knowing the identity and that viable transactions and uh, uh, attestations that you are who you are you have this license you have this uh, permit to use these uh, research research materials for this period of time uh, that all comes into play very interested interested to see what you're doing thank you very much Ned I think you are next All right. So thank you really very, very much for inviting me here and putting all this together. Um, it's a lot of work and I really appreciate your all's work. So I'm Nat Sakimura, the chairman of the board of the OpenID Foundation. We are a global open standard organization that creates open identity technical protocols. And as the name suggests, we really uh, value the openness and we welcome the formation of Open Wallet Foundation and its efforts to create an open source implementation of open and interoperable technical standards, certification and best practices. It's critical to enable people to assert their identity wherever they choose and that goes together with our mission statement. So. We're really looking forward to its development. Thank you very much, Ned. Uh, you know, one of the, the reasons why I think it's so important that Ned is, is here and Judith is here and, and, and Drummond, uh, wherever you are now, <laughs> over here, uh, not just as a representative of uh, Norton LifeLock and, and Avast, but uh, a steering board member of, of Trust over IP. And we have other people here from Trust over IP as well. Is, um, one of the misconceptions about the Open Wallet Foundation is that this is a standardization organization, and we are not. Um, we are standing on the shoulders of giants who are standardization organizations. We will not be a better or a different DIF or Open ID Foundation or Trust over IP Foundation. Um, these standards are at the heart of what we're doing, and in order to succeed, we need standards but we are not a standardization organization. Um, so thank you very much for being here. Uh, Nick, talking about standards, uh, on to you. Nick, you're on mute. I'm on mute, yes, <laughs> it's a good boy ever. Um, thank you, Daniel, and I'd you know, like to thank you personally for convening this, for your inspirational leadership, as you did with Gain, 
leading us all to collaborate and create something of absolute global use and necessity. Um, we can't thank you enough for that. So I'm Nick Mothershaw, uh, Chief Identity Strategist at the Open Identity Exchange, and we're all about interoperability. And we operate at the policy level, not the technical level. Uh, so we're about the rules, not the tools of how we make digital identity a success around the globe. Um, we have four principles when we talk about digital identity, choice, convenience, control and confidence. And the Open Wallet Foundation is helping bring those principles to life. Choice with a plurality of wallets in the market, wallets that aren't fettered to the user's operating system. Uh, convenience, because I can put lots of different um, credentials within the wallet and use them wherever I wish. Uh, control because they're mine and they are, they are managed by the user and all of that leads to confidence in using the wallet and using digital identity around the globe. Um, we we believe at OAX to be successful we, in digital identity we need smart wallets and OWF will enable a market of smart wallets to emerge and you know smart wallet is something that works on behalf of the user. It enables them to collect credentials together and it helps deal with complex requests. Are you over 18? Which might not sound complex, but it is. Are you fit to fly? Are you COVID safe? Are you able to work in my regulatory environment? Can you open a bank account? The rules around these things are too complex for users to understand. A smart wallet needs to help the user through that process. And we see that you know, only by being smart will wallets be successful and the components that we'd see OWF building would be key to enabling that smart wallet ecosystem. And key to that is interoperability. So we're working with our members and six trust frameworks from across the globe, describing the policy, the metadata about a trust framework. So that can be shared across trust frameworks and can be published by a trust framework into a wallet. So the wallet can seamlessly move from framework to framework. I want my wallet that's maybe based in the UK, if I come to Ireland or go to Singapore or the US, it should still work. It should adapt dynamically to the rules of the new trust framework based on the policy descriptions that are published by that trust framework. And that's that's what we're working on at the moment. And we would expect that to manifest in open source components for policy access, policy interpretation, policy request from relying parties and policy management from users that would sit around a wallet that would enable the wallet to be dynamic as it moves from place to place. And that's what we see, and yeah, to Drummond's point earlier, these things need to be portable and they need to, to work around the globe seamlessly. Um, we're delighted to be working with the other organisations around the table here. And um, at OX, we'd like to welcome this new arrival. Um, it's, a, I think it's, it's pregnant at the moment and uh, we anticipate hope its birth uh, imminently. And at that point, we'll you know, welcome its arrival into the, this family of open initiatives that are collaborating to make this, this global vision possible. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. It's, it's great to have uh, not-for-profit companies being involved. It's great to have uh, for-profit companies. I think on our last call, we had over $2.5 trillion worth of public companies join the call. And I think this is really critical and key for success. But I also believe that it is equally important to have um, people involved who are close to governments and who actually have successes under their belt uh, when it comes to digital public goods. And uh, two of my personal heroes in that regard are, are on the call today. Pramod, you're one of them, and I think you're next. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, pleasure to be here. and. Uh... Wonderful to see the energy and the birth of uh, Open Wallet Foundation. Congratulations to all of you. Um, my name is Pramod. I am the chief architect of India's identity program that has covered 1.33 billion people and also India's digital credentialing uh, and data empowerment, uh, sort of known as India Stack, uh, you know, set of stuff that we have been doing. And my partner in crime is here, Sanjay. But, uh, and I'll speak, let him speak from the market perspective, but I'll speak from societal perspective because that's what I've been doing in the last 12, 13 years. And uh, India specifically focused on ensuring identity and data and credentials are in the control of billion people. And this is, it was fundamental 
into our digital opening up our digital economy and these are not concepts anymore india does a billion digital authentications every month uh, 6 billion you know payment transactions every month and so we have been in the last 5 years or 6 years dramatically shift the underlying societal uh, you know ability of hundreds of millions of people to participate in formal systems and that's almost always missed out when you know many of you may not be exposed to that kind of volumes of people and the diversity that india faces uh, for us the top of the pyramid the 10 percentage of india which is about 100 million people uh, is a, really all of us and that's not enough at all so we need millions of individuals and smes to be brought into the formal system and that's the reason we have been fundamentally focusing on identity personal data and credentialing and all in the hands of people now in the hands of people in india does not mean smartphone so we have to be also be very very cognizant of an inclusive uh, infrastructure digital infrastructure and specifically today why i am excited the moment daniel talked about it i said must do probably a couple of, couple of years late but let's do it right it's very very key and india specifically did something called digi locker and that currently covers 7 billion digital credentials in the wallet in digi locker uh, and we have we had to create our own standards and move on with it uh, many times because of we were actually implementing it standards were not ready and an example was covid vaccination covid vaccination as you know india has issued 2 billion vaccination credential all based on w3c and who standards uh, but we really have no interoperable wallet in play and we really have no portability in play uh, globally and we still are challenged challenged by silly reasons frankly so i am very very excited about the possibility of this engine i think that's a very very good setup for you an engine that ensures portability and interoperability uh, but various solutioning can be layered on top of it because we need multilingual multimodal solutions to emerge but the core engine uh, can be provided by an open source community uh, very very powerful and <laughs> You know, we need it right now. So please jump in the pool and participate and build it. And I can promise you, Indians will put a hundred billion credentials in the next two years. Hundred billion. So I can promise you numbers. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I can promise you numbers. But we really need your help. So please go ahead and do it. Happy to provide all, everything we do here in my at least from my side, whether it's you know Sunbird under XF Foundation. We have we have uh, credentialing infrastructure. Uh, open source issuance infrastructure. Everything is open source. So we are heavily into open source digital public goods building that. So happy to contribute in every way we can. We have no much money though, uh, Daniel. So we are all volunteers and not for profit efforts. So, but I can contribute my brain. So happy to contribute. <laughs> <in everything. laughs> okay, thank you so much. All the best. And what a brain that is, Pramod. Um, you know, I love how you and uh, and your friends in India are keeping us honest. Uh, we were on this call a couple of weeks ago, where we have a a call about you know credential formats, and it was literally a one of the uh, the architects of a trillion dollar company on the phone with someone who said yes. I understand about zero knowledge proofs, but how are we going to do this if all you have is a piece of paper? and a QR code, or if all you have is a feature phone that is shared by eight people that belong to the same family, what are we going to do then? And this is exactly the kind of conversations I think we need to have if we want inclusive digital identity, and if we want to have inclusive wallet systems. So thank you for keeping us honest uh, to not just talking about uh, inclusivity, but actually thinking inclusivity through. Um, and as Kalia, you said, you know, it's going to take us time. We'll need to start with a couple of stacks. But I think the ambition of everyone here is to really be helpful to as many people as possible in as many countries as possible for as many use cases as possible. 
that's, I think, uh, the benchmark, uh, and, and, and that's what we need to achieve uh, if we want this to be even more than an interesting, uh, an interesting opportunity. So you mentioned your partner in crime. I think your partner in crime is also next alphabetically. Sanjay, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Pramod, for that exciting uh, promise of uh, a billion people, 100 billion credentials. And uh, today, I, here I'm actually going to talk more about the work we are doing for identity around the world. I am representing MOSEP, which is the modular open source ID platform. And we are currently helping countries uh, develop national IDs. And one of the things that is very exciting for us is that we are already thinking about issuing an ID document as a verifiable credential. And the moment we can put it into a wallet with selective disclosure, that actually brings in a whole bunch of use cases. Uh, we are already live in two countries, uh, 70 million IDs already, people already registered for the ID. And we have nine more countries in the pipeline. So by end of next year, we'll have another 500 million people that we will be able to bring onto the system with dig uh, digital national IDs issued as verifiable, verifiable credentials. And we will be looking for use cases. Uh, let's be sure of that. Uh, in use cases, will be around banking, around travel, around uh, payments, and so on. And so I think this is very exciting for us to see how the work that you're doing at the bottom of the pyramid is actually converging and merging with the work that's being done for the developed economies. And it's really all one. And uh, that's really something that we never expected to encounter so soon. And but I'm glad we are. And I think we will be able to bring about a billion and a half people into this system fairly soon. So let's get ready for that. Thank you very much. Uh, Mike, uh, I'm not sure we are two minutes over, but if the Linux Foundation is giving us a few more minutes. Uh, do we have anything in here next? I think it's a break. Lunch. Lunch break. Lunch. 12.50. 12.50? Oh. Is there anything after this? Oh, you can go for as long as you like. Yeah, okay. So if we have a few minutes, uh, Brian, I would like to put you on the spot <laughs> because you and Jair are the first two open source heroes that I actually met in person. <laughs> and maybe you can say something about, you know, why, why open source? Why, uh, why should we use open source technology? Well, I, I didn't expect to speak. Thank you for you the invitation. You did not expect I was to drafting speak. here ideas, and as the people were mentioning them, I was crossing them out. So um, well, I want to start with, we are late to this game. We're about 20 years late. Um, in uh, 1998, the, the source- Dog years, right? So 140 years in, in terms. Sure. Uh, in 1998, the Mozilla source code was released, partly based on a fortuitous and happenstance conversation between Jim Barksdale and Eric Raymond's that almost didn't happen at a time when Netscape's business model was just about to crash. So it almost didn't happen. And had it not happened, I doubt we would have had an open web. We would have had uh, uh, two, uh, two, maybe three different th different webs that would have been as different as the Windows desktop and the Apple laptop uh, at the time in the mid 90s. <laughs> and it, even though the, the Firefox market share, you know, climbed at one point to be 60 ish percent, I think, um, and is now down to much lower numbers, it still is a useful force out there for getting other browser makers to converge on common standards. There's still not just enough uh, usage of it, there's still the moral leadership. And having had a platform for turning not just standards that were good ideas and thoughtful things into to consumer software in a rapid basis. Not only was that uh, a, a great a great thing, there was a moral leadership that came from being able to say, let's think about the end user's needs centered on them and start to introduce things like blocking of pop-ups, <laughs> which were a thing uh, in the early you know, time that people hated, but the browser makers loved because the advertisers loved it, et cetera. Uh, and that it became you know, blocking more of kind of the surveillance capitalism kind of stuff. So having, having a, a platform like this is really good to center it on the user's needs, uh, to turn emerging, emerging standards into things things that actually have an impact uh, for things, especially for the consumer side. Uh, uh, and it was something that we lacked uh, when about a year ago, uh, many of us here were working on uh, over the last couple of years, COVID credentials came up with some gorgeous specifications for it, building on top of a lot of pre-existing code and had some successes, but also a lot of struggles actually getting that out 
into the end user community and getting it accepted and standardized by governments of the world because of a lack of an efficient vehicle, an efficient platform for getting this out there. I think, though, that raised a lot of the issues that might have served as seeds for the Open Web Foundation and, and hopefully the uh, Open Wallet Foundation. And hopefully this will be one of the first wins for, for us is uh, uh, bringing healthcare data into this space. Gar, I don't know if Gar is still here, uh, he, uh, might even be able to speak to that if we have time. Um, I, I do also just want to say two more things. Um, one is I, I know a lot of the focus has been on payment rails uh, and on digital identities and self-sovereign ID in particular, uh, I think is a really important thing to get out there. And there's some great starting points. Um, uh, the Hyperledger Foundation has been working on this kind of technology for a while and has, you won't be able, you won't need to start from scratch is the good news. Um, there's more, lots of work to do on top of this, but uh, it's a great starting point. But I would encourage you not to ignore digital assets uh, as a, a network native digital assets call them cryptos if you need to uh, or like uh, and that's obviously you know on the down uh, at, a, at a low point right now in, in the cycle but there is still something there in terms of how the next gen of the web evolves and identity is central to that connecting these is essential especially as it gets normalized regulated kyc comes in um, uh, actually tying this all together is going to be an important thing the second point i'd make is don't ignore the secure the centrality of security into this system. If there is a bug, a Log4j style bug in this software, it will lead to real losses of actual real assets that may be hard to recover um, uh, or losses of keys tied to your identities that having to reboot, you know, your uh, educational credentials, let alone other things would be just a ma massive uh, mistake. So where there are resources to spend to help the ecosystem, um, spending those on everything from third party audits to, to signing infrastructure to, to just other things that you can to harden that and to lead people to trust that core is going to be a great uh, thing to do early on in the life cycle of this to build up that public confidence in what you're building. So with all that, I'm incredibly enthusiastic. The right set of partners are here. I'm convinced all the other right partners are going to come on very quickly. Uh, I can't wait to follow and, and, and see where this goes. So thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. I realize we're keeping uh, people from their, from their lunch. So thank you again uh, for for joining. Uh, thank you, especially to those who joined at uh, four o'clock in the morning. Uh, I received a signal message from someone who was trying to get into this room and said that he heard that the room was full. So this is my pledge. And I think probably the pledge of a lot of people here, we will try not to have full rooms. We will try not to have messages. I hated that message when uh, a party in Austria said the boat is full. We want you to be here. We pledge to try to keep making rooms bigger, finding bigger venues or bigger rooms, to have a tent that works for everyone who's interested in open, interoperable, secure, multi-purpose wallets. If you're interested in payments, if you're interested in digital identity, if you're interested in wallets and you hope for a future where these wallets are uh, not just a few, but where a lot of wallets are blossom, please join the Open Wallet Foundation. Find us after this panel. Uh, email info at openwallet.foundation. Um, we want to hear from you and we really look forward to working with you. Yeah, so we are we are coordinating with everybody we have contact information for. So as Daniel said, info at openwallet.foundation or go on the openwallet.foundation website. And there's a form there. If you fill out the form, that'll give us the ability to add you to our groups list and things like that that we're setting up for everything. So um, if you're not part of that, uh, please submit and help us uh, connect with you so we know to follow up. Thank you.